know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk presents my revisionist history of Billy Bonney's killing by Sheriff Pat Garrett. The information is from my books, The Lost Pardon of Billy the Kid and The Coroner's Jury Report of Billy the Kid. After Billy Bonney's odds-defying jailbreak on April 28, 1881, 15 days before scheduled hanging, his whereabouts were a mystery. In fact, he'd gone to Fort Sumner and was hiding in the Maxwell family's sheep camps with likely permission from Peter Maxwell and his mother, Luz Maxwell. And Billy presumably continued his secret romance with Peter's sister, Paulita. But New Mexico Territory's press went wild with bogus sightings and the Billy the Kid outlaw myth. On May 4th, the Santa Fe Daily New Mexican published a letter to the editor from White Oaks signed Just D. It was titled, More Killing by the Kid, when but a short distance from Lincoln he meets one of his old enemies and kills him and his companion. It stated, Information reaches us tonight to the effect that the kid, while escaping from justice, met Billy Matthews and an unknown party and killed them both. The tragedy occurred a few miles from Lincoln. Matthews was one of Lincoln County's best men and was always an enemy of the kids, having shot him through the thigh in the Lincoln County War. On May 5th, the Santa Fe Daily New Mexican published two untitled stories. One stated, Anything that the imagination can concoct in the way of murders and desperate deeds may be heard upon the reports now in regard to Billy the Kid. There was a report that the kid was in Albuquerque and was bound for Santa Fe. It was also said that he had killed another man near there. The other had Billy back at his Stinking Springs capture site. It stated, Mr. Richard Dunham says that on the second instant he met the kid at Stinking Springs. The kid said that he was going to Salt Lake, but that he intended doing up Santa Fe on his trip. He desired, he said, to pay his respects to Governor Wallace and U.S. Marshal Sherman, after which he would probably hunt up his old associates in Durango. He says he has been badly treated and spoke as though he had no particular love to waste on anyone. What was true was that 31-year-old Pat Garrett thus far had failed his Santa Fe ring mission to kill Billy. In 1880, when Lincoln County Sheriff-elect and working with Secret Service operative Azariah Wild who made him a deputy U.S. Marshal for the task, Garrett first tried to kill Billy on December 19, 1880, in a Fort Sumner ambush, but he accidentally shot dead Billy's companion, Tom O'Falliard, instead. On December 22, at the Stinking Springs ambush, Garrett mistook Billy's companion, Charlie Bowdry, for Billy and killed him. Garrett then settled on taking Billy captive. 
Garrett's next chance to kill Billy was by hanging in Lincoln on May 13th, but Billy's jailbreak ended that option. Garrett's hunt for escape Billy is in his 1882 ghost-written book titled The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, the noted desperado of the Southwest, whose deeds of daring and blood made his name a terror in New Mexico, Arizona, and northern Mexico. The Hunt was also published by one of Garrett's deputies, John William Poe, in his 1933 book, The Death of Billy the Kid. It was first printed in 1922 by an E.A. Stool as a booklet titled The Killing of Billy the Kid. In his book, Garrett wrote that he'd heard that Billy was hiding with the Maxwell sheep herders. Garrett wrote, during the weeks following the kid's escape, I was censured by some for my seeming inactivity. But I was quietly at work seeking trustworthy information and maturing my plan of action. To be noted is that Garrett's being a deputy U.S. Marshal gave him territory-wide jurisdiction. He stated that he reused a spy from Billy Stinking Springs Capture, Fort Sumner area rancher Manuel Brazil, who now informed that Billy was seen locally. Garrett enlisted two deputies, John William Poe and Thomas Kip McKinney. On July 13th, he, Poe, and McKinney arrived five miles south of Fort Sumner to meet with Brazil, but he backed out. Garrett wrote that on the morning of July 14th, he told Poe to do reconnaissance as a stranger in Fort Sumner. Poe was then to go seven miles north to Sunnyside and check with its postmaster, Milner Rudolph. That night, Poe met up with Garrett and McKinney four miles north of Fort Sumner. He reported that Rudolph confirmed Billy's being in the area. Garrett wrote, When I heard Poe's report, I concluded to go and have a talk with Peter Maxwell, in whom I felt sure I could rely. The three men went on foot through a peach orchard toward Maxwell's house. In the orchard, they saw a distant man standing up. Garrett wrote, he wore a broad-brimmed hat, dark vest and pants, and was in his shirt sleeves. He went to the fence, jumped it, and walked down toward the Maxwell house. Little as we then expected it, this man was the kid. Garrett added that after the killing, he learned that Billy had been in the house of, quote, a Mexican friend where he took off his boots. He then asked for a butcher knife to go to Maxwell's and, quote, get some beef because he was hungry. Garrett wrote that Billy stayed in his socks because, quote, Maxwell's house was but a few steps distant. Garrett wrote that at Maxwell's house, he left Poe and McKinney, quote, at the end of the porch, about 20 feet from the door of Pete's bedroom, while I myself entered it. It was nearly midnight, and Pete was in bed. I walked to the head of the bed and sat down near the pillow, and beside Maxwell's head, I asked him as to the whereabouts of the kid, he replied that the kid certainly had been about, but he did not know whether he had left or not. At that moment, a man sprang quickly into the door and, looking back, called twice in Spanish, Quien es? Quien es? Who comes there? No one replied, and he came into the room. I could see that he was bareheaded, and from his tread, I could perceive he was either barefooted or in stocking feet. He held a revolver in his right hand and a butcher knife in his left. 
He came directly towards the bed where I was sitting at the head of Maxwell's bed. Before he reached the bed, I whispered, who is it, Pete, but received no reply. It struck me that he might be Pete's brother-in-law, Manuel Abreu, who had seen Poe and McKinney outside and wanted to know their business. The intruder came close to me, leaned both hands on the bed, his right hand almost touching my knee, and asked in a low tone, who are they, Pete? At the same instant, Maxwell whispered to me, that's him. Simultaneously, the kid must have seen or felt the presence of a third person at the head of the bed. He raised quickly his pistol, a self-cocker within a foot of my breast. Retreating rapidly across the room, he cried, KNS, KNS, who's that, who's that? As quickly as possible, I drew my revolver and fired, threw my body to one side and fired again. The second shot was useless. The kid fell dead at the first one. He never spoke. I went to the door and met Poe and McKinney there. Maxwell rushed out the door past me and the others. Poe and McKinney drew their guns on him, but he shouted to them, don't shoot. I told my companions that I had got the kid. They asked if I had shot the wrong man. I told them I had made no mistake, for I knew the kid's voice too well. Garrett explained, to both of them, the kid was entirely unknown. They had seen him pass by them when they were sitting on the porch. He probably saw their guns and thereupon threw down his own weapon as he sprang to the doorway, calling out KNS. Seeing a bareheaded, barefooted man in his shirt sleeves with a butcher knife in his hand and hearing his hail in excellent Spanish, they naturally supposed him to be a Mexican and an attache of the establishment, hence their suspicion that I had shot the wrong man. We now entered the room and examined the body. The ball had struck him just above the heart. Poe's book described Garrett initially entering Maxwell's bedroom through, quote, the open door left open on account of the extremely warm weather. He continued, it was probably not more than 30 seconds after Garrett had entered Maxwell's room when my attention was attracted to a man approaching me. I observed he was only partially dressed and was both bareheaded and barefooted or rather had only socks on his feet and it seemed to me he was fastening his trousers. As Maxwell's place was the one place in Fort Sumner that I considered above suspicion of harboring the kid, I was entirely off my guard, the thought coming to my mind that the man approaching was either Maxwell or some guest of his. Upon seeing me, he covered me with his six-shooter as quick as lightning, sprang onto the porch calling out in Spanish, Quienes, who is it, at the same time backing from me toward the door. An instant after the man left the door, I heard a voice inquire in a sharp tone, Pete, who are those fellows on the outside? An instant later, a shot was fired in the room. A moment after, Garrett came out the door. Pete Maxwell rushed squarely into me, and I surely would have shot him, but for Garrett striking my gun down, saying, don't shoot Maxwell. We afterward discovered that the kid had frequently been at his house after his escape from Lincoln, but Maxwell stood in such terror of him that he did not dare inform against him. Poe wrote that they looked into the bedroom through a window with a candle placed by Maxwell on its outside sill. They, quote, saw a man lying stretched upon his back dead in the middle of the room with a six-shooter lying at his right hand and a butcher knife at his left. Upon examining the body, we found it to be Billy the Kid. There's no historical doubt that Pat Garrett killed Billy Bonney that July 14th, 1881 night. But Garrett's coincidental encounter tale, repeated by Poe and by Maxwell, 
is unconvincing. I believe the tale kept secrets which can be deciphered. First is the coincidental encounter itself. It required Garrett and Billy to both intrude on presumably sleeping Peter Maxwell in the middle of the same night for no urgent reason and within seconds of each other. Poe wrote, quote, it was probably not more than 30 seconds after Garrett had entered Maxwell's room, close quote, that the man who was Billy approached and entered the bedroom. Poe continued, an instant after the man left the door, I heard a voice inquire, Pete, who are those fellows on the outside? An instant later, a shot was fired in the room. Close quote. One can conclude that the odds of this happening as told strain credulity. In his lead up, Garrett claimed that after Billy's jailbreak, he delayed for, quote, maturing his plan of action. He admitted to using a spy, Manuel Brazil. Brazil confirmed Billy being in Fort Sumner's vicinity, but backed out of further informing. Garrett also had Poe use Sunnyside Postmaster Milner Rudolph. Poe's long round trip of seven miles to get there from Fort Sumner reconnaissance and three miles back to Garrett's nighttime meeting point four miles north of Fort Sumner may have been justified by Rudolph's being a ringite. In 1872, as Speaker of the House, he'd helped crush an anti-ring uprising in the legislature. Ring beholden Garrett likely knew Rudolph would betray anti-ring Billy. And he did. So Garrett admittedly used spies. But having Billy in the vicinity doesn't get him into Maxwell's bedroom that night. Garrett tried to distract from that problem by an irrelevant story of not recognizing Billy as a distant man in the peach orchard. Garrett got himself into Maxwell's bedroom by claiming he suddenly decided to check with him about Billy. But lacking urgent reason, it made no sense for him to barge into his bedroom near midnight. And, as happens with lying, truth creeps in. Garrett had Maxwell reply that, quote, the kid certainly had been about. That proved Maxwell was not only aware of Billy's presence, but willing to disclose it to the man obviously hunting him. I believe that this communication happened earlier during Garrett's, quote, maturing plan of action. In fact, Peter Maxwell was vulnerable to coercion. He already endured months of ring press locating the fictional rustling, counterfeiting Billy the Kid gang to his town. That left him a target for the ring's malicious prosecution for harboring criminals. He was also vulnerable to bribery. When his father, Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell, bought Fort Sumner in 1870 for $5,000, he got only the old fort. Peter was then litigating for the property's 13,000 acres with which he could have been bribed. One can conclude that Maxwell had been recruited as a traitor. Noteworthy is that the coincidental encounter tale protests Maxwell's innocence too much. Garrett wrote that Maxwell, quote, did not know whether the kid had left or not. Poe wrote that it was his idea to check with Maxwell because Garrett thought they were on a cold trail. But Garrett had written, when I heard Poe's report from Milner Rudolph, I concluded to go and have a talk with Pete Maxwell. Poe had joined in. Maxwell's place was the one place in Fort Sumner that I considered above suspicion of harboring the kid. For the killing, Garrett first wrote that Maxwell whispered, that's him. 
but he then made himself the identifier by writing, Paul and McKinney asked if I had shot the wrong man. I told them I had made no mistake, for I knew the kid's voice too well. About Maxwell, Poet added, I learned afterward that Maxwell was at heart a well-meaning, inoffensive man, but very timid. Poe concluded, We afterward discovered that the kid had frequently been at his house after his escape, but Maxwell stood in such terror of him that he did not dare inform against him. Garrett even used the press. The headline in July 21st, Santa Fe Daily New Mexican, was Garrett Exonerates Maxwell. Garrett portrayed Maxwell as an accidental witness to the shooting. Garrett was quoted, he does not think that Maxwell was in with the kid. He says that Pete acknowledged that fear kept him from informing on the kid. Poe's book stated, there have been many wild and untrue stories of this affair, one of which was that we had in some way learned in advance that the kid would come to Maxwell's residence that night and had concealed ourselves there with the purpose of waylaying and killing him. The actual facts, however, are as stated herein." Close quote. At the inquest, Maxwell himself gave a witness statement. He stuck to the coincidental encounter tale, stating, I, being in my bed at about midnight on the 14th day of July, Pat F. Garrett came into my room and sat at the end of my bed to talk with me. A little while after Garrett sat down, William Bonney came in. One can conclude that Maxwell needed to be concealed as a traitor for his own protection. Poe described danger to himself, Garrett, and McKinney from enraged townspeople. He wrote, we spent the remainder of the night on the Maxwell premises, keeping constantly on our guard as we were expecting to be attacked by the friends of the dead man. But Maxwell, enabling an ambush, doesn't get Billy into his bedroom that night. The coincidental encounter tale floats that Billy entered to check about strangers. But to wake the town's patron to ask about visitors to his town, which commonly had visitors, isn't convincing. And alternatively, if Billy thought they were hunting him, he would have retreated from the property. Garrett was so defensive about this weak link in the tale that he kept secret who Billy had been staying with. Garrett cited a, quote, Mexican friend, where Billy took off his boots, felt hungry, got a butcher's knife, and walked to Maxwell's to, quote, get some beef. Garrett explained his socks by saying, quote, Maxwell's house was but a few steps distant. In fact, the so-called Mexican friend was Garrett's sister-in-law by marriage, Celsa Gutierrez, with her being Garrett's wife's sister. And her house, where she lived with her sheep herder husband, Sabal, was not a few steps distant, but was on a diagonal across the 300 by 400 foot parade ground around which stood the residentially converted past military buildings. Garrett thus shielded his relative from looking like the one who got Billy into the bedroom. And the I'm hungry excuse for going to the side of beef didn't get Billy to the bedroom anyway. It hung on Maxwell's north porch as his courtesy to town's residence. His bedroom was at the opposite side of his big mansion, the old forts converted officer's quarters at its southeast corner. One can conclude that what got Billy into the bedroom was concealed. A secret conspirator is implied. It's known that Billy stayed in the Maxwell's sheep camps telling Billy that the Patron wanted to see him on a specific night or duping a friend of Billy's to give him that information could get Billy into the bedroom. 
And during his late 1880 hunt for Billy, Garrett had used Maxwell's past foreman and his own friend, Barney Mason, as a spy. Mason could have named locals as potential traitors. One can conclude that the coincidental encounter tale was to hide participants. Then there is the bedroom's darkness glitch in the coincidental encounter tale. Outside was almost light as day because the moon was almost full and hung low on the horizon. Poe wrote, the moon was shining very brightly. In fact, when outside, both Garrett and Poe had full visibility that night. For his peach orchard sighting, Garrett wrote about the distant man. He wore a broad-brimmed hat, dark vest and pants, and was in his shirt sleeves. He went to the fence, jumped it, and walked down toward the Maxwell house. Poe wrote about the approaching man. I observed that he was only partially dressed and was both bareheaded and barefooted, or rather had only socks on his feet, and it seemed to me he was fastening his trousers. But for the bedroom scene to work, absolute darkness is needed. Poe wrote that after Billy, quote, disappeared into the room, he, Poe, couldn't see what took place inside, quote, on account of its darkness. Key was that Billy had to be unable to see looming six feet four Garrett sitting beside Maxwell's pillow, even when Billy was so close to Garrett that his hand on Maxwell's bed almost touched Garrett's knee. That degree of blindness would exceed Billy's incomplete light adaptation or shadowing from the overhanging porch. Worse, this absolute darkness didn't apply to the bedroom or to Garrett or to Maxwell. First of all, the room's door was open. As Post said, it was, quote, left open on account of the extremely warm weather, close quote. In fact, Fort Sumner in July has a high of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So moonlight from that open door would have been illuminating even if the windows had drawn curtains. And that moonlight did let Garrett see Billy, though he himself had entered seconds earlier and would have had incomplete dark adaptation too. Garrett wrote, I could see that he was bareheaded. He held a revolver in his right hand and a butcher knife in his left. In fact, Garrett saw Billy so well that he shot him at a distance right in the heart. Garrett wrote, retreating rapidly across the room, he cried, Key and S, as quickly as possible, I drew my revolver and fired. And to account for Billy bolting, the tail suddenly lets Billy see a third person and point his revolver 12 inches from his chest. Garrett wrote, the kid must have seen or felt the presence of a third person at the head of the bed. He raised quickly his pistol, a self-cocker, within a foot of my breast. Then the tale reverted to absolute darkness. Poe described needing candlelight. He wrote, looking through the window with a candle placed by Maxwell on its outside sill, we saw a man lying stretched upon his back in the middle of the room with a six-shooter lying at his right hand and a butcher knife at his left, close quote. But the window's candle added another glitch, proving its curtains were not drawn. So moonlight through that window, as well as through the open door, would have lit the room for entering Billy. One can conclude that the room was not too dark for Billy to see Garrett if he was positioned on Maxwell's bed. Hearing was also a glitch for the coincidental encounter tale. From the outside porch, Poe could hear the man in the bedroom ask, Pete, who are those fellows on the outside? Inside, Garrett could even hear Billy's unshod footsteps riding. From his tread, I could perceive he was either barefooted or in stocking feet. 
but Billy, almost touching Garrett and Maxwell on the bed, couldn't hear Garrett whisper, who is it, Pete? One can conclude that Billy, beside the bed, would have heard Garrett and Maxwell if they conversed. Then there is the coincidental encounter tales near shooting of Maxwell glitch. Garrett wrote, Poe and McKinney drew their guns on Maxwell, but he shouted to them, don't shoot. Poe wrote, a moment after Garrett came out of the door, Pete Maxwell rushed squarely into me, and I surely would have shot him, but for Garrett striking my gun down, saying, don't shoot Maxwell. But Poe and McKinney were supposedly unaware that it was Billy the Kid who'd entered. Poe had written, Maxwell's place was the one place in Fort Sumner that I had considered above suspicion of harboring the kid. Poe claimed that he thought the entry man was, quote, either Maxwell or some guest of his. All Poe and McKinney supposedly knew was that Garrett was checking with Maxwell. It's absurd that they try to kill an unrecognized man exiting. One can conclude that the deputies were actually stationed by Garrett in a premeditated plan to shoot someone rushing out. Then there is the coincidental encounter tales glitch of Billy's revolver. Poe wrote, upon his seeing me, he covered me with his six shooter. Garrett wrote, he raised quickly his pistol, a self cocker within a foot of my breast. Close quote. Later, looking into the candlelit room, Poe wrote that Billy was, quote, dead in the middle of the room with a six shooter lying at his right hand. Close quote. But no gun was recovered. One can conclude that Billy's being armed was important to the tale, even if he wasn't armed. Then, there is the coincidental encounter tales glitch of three shots heard. Poe wrote that right after Billy entered, quote, a shot was fired in the room followed immediately by what everyone within hearing distance thought was two shots fired. The third report, as we learned afterwards, being caused by the rebound of the second bullet, which had struck the adobe wall and rebounded against the headboard of the wooden bedstead. But that second bullet's rebound and strike would position firing Garrett across the room facing the bed instead of being at the bed and firing into the room. My conclusion is that this coincidental encounter tale was made up to keep secret that Billy was intentionally ambushed by Garrett and his deputies with collusion of Peter Maxwell and an unknown conspirator who directed Billy into the trap. I believe that Maxwell was in bed as a decoy while Garrett hid across the room and facing the bed where Billy would go. I believe there was enough light for Billy to notice hiding Garrett, but his bolting made Garrett immediately shoot. I don't believe that Billy had a revolver because Garrett would have kept it. At Stinking Springs, Garrett took from Charlie Bowdry's body his bloody carte de visite, showing him with his wife. Garrett likewise took Billy Wilson's Winchester carbine at that Stinking Springs capture. He would have kept dead Billy's gun, but it has never appeared and the butcher's knife belonging to Celsa and Sabal Guterres, which Billy did have, is known to this day. The self-cocker or double-action revolver, which Garrett did claim, was a well-known six-shot hideaway weapon, the Colt 41 Frontier. I believe the revolver fiction was intended to make the coincidental encounter tale appear as justifiable homicide by self-defense instead of murder 
by premeditated ambush. That was Garrett's presentation in his July 15, 1881 letter, the day after the killing, to acting Governor William Rich. It was published on July 23, 1881's Las Cruces Rio Grande Republican as Kid the Killer Killed, William Bonney, alias Antrim, alias Billy the Kid, fatally meets Pat Garrett, the Lincoln County Sheriff. It stated, It was my desire to have been able to take him alive, but his coming upon me so suddenly and unexpectedly leads me to believe that he had seen me enter the room or had been informed by someone of the fact and that he came there armed with pistol and knife expressly to kill me if he could. Under that impression, I had no alternative but to kill him or to suffer death at his hands." Close quote. Furthermore, the near shooting of Peter Maxwell by deputies Poe and McKinney outside his bedroom door shows that they were positioned to kill Billy if he escaped the ambush. Nevertheless, this coincidental encounter tale doesn't remove the truth that Billy Bonney was killed by Pat Garrett on July 14, 1881. He was 21 years, 7 months, and 22 days old. Billy's corpse was profusely identified. First, it was identified by Pat Garrett and Peter Maxwell, who knew him well. Then, Billy was identified by Fort Sumner's residents, who also knew him well. Poe wrote, Within a very short time after the shooting, quite a number of Native people had gathered around, some of them bewailing the death of their friend, while several of the women pleaded for permission to take charge of the body, which we allowed them to do. They carried it across the yard to a carpenter shop, where it was laid out on a workbench, the women placing candles around it according to their ideas of properly conducting a wake for the dead." Close quote. So the women identified the body. Then up to 200 townspeople who attended the wake with Billy laid out on the sheet-covered carpenter's bench identified him. Then Billy was identified by the Maxwell family's unemancipated Navajo slave, Delavina, who was close to him. On July 4, 1927, she was interviewed in Fort Sumner by historian J. Evitz Haley. She stated, I came here in about 1869 and was here when Billy the Kid was killed. Billy the Kid was my compadre, my friend, poor Billy. Pete Maxwell had told Billy he better go as Pat Garrett was coming after him. Billy said he did not care. He was not afraid of Pat Garrett. Note as an aside that this sounds like Maxwell tried to save Billy from the ambush about which he knew. Delavina continued, the night he was killed, Billy came in hungry, went down with a butcher knife to get some meat at Pete Maxwell's. After passing the men outside, he went into Maxwell's room where Garrett was and he shot him. The story is that I was there and went in with a candle to see if Billy was dead. I did not do it. Pete took a candle and held it around the window. When they saw he was dead, Garrett and Maxwell went in. Most of the native people, Mexicans, who lived in town went to his funeral. I did not see Billy the night after he was killed, but I saw him the following morning. Note that Delavino confirmed the majority of the townspeople witnessing the body and her own identification. And for years, she laid wildflowers on Billy's grave. On July 15th, an inquest was held by Justice of the Peace Alejandro Segura. Segura appointed six jurymen with Sunnyside Postmaster Milner Rudolph as president. Segura wrote their coroner's jury report in Spanish 
for Santa Fe's district attorney of the first judicial district, which included San Miguel County's Fort Sumner. Peter Maxwell was the witness. He stated, I being in my bed in my room at about midnight on the 14th day of July, Pat F. Garrett came into my room and sat on the end of my bed to talk with me. A little while after Garrett sat down, William Bonney came in and got close to my bed with a gun in his hand and asked me, who is it, who is it? And then Pat F. Garrett fired two shots at the said William Bonney and the said Bonney fell near my fireplace and I went out of the room and when I came in again about three or four minutes after the shots, the said Bonnie was dead. The six jurymen identified the body and gave their verdict. They stated, we the jury unanimously find that William Bonnie has been killed by a bullet in the left breast in the region of the heart, the same having been fired from a pistol in the hand of Pat F. Garrett and our verdict is that the act of said Garrett was justifiable homicide. On February 18th, 1882, Pat Garrett, through an act of the legislature, was granted Lou Wallace's $500 Billy the Kid reward because of certainty that he had killed Billy Bonney. Later talks will discuss Billy Bonney's coroner's jury report in detail and will also show how Lou Wallace, the man responsible for Billy's death, spent the rest of his life writing outlaw myth articles about Billy the Kid to bury his guilt. <laughs> <laughs>